presenters are involved um, with the Sea Grant, and I want to introduce it a little bit, give you some background. So, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Sea Grant is a partnership bringing the federal government together with universities, like the University of Washington, to support coastal communities through science and policy. The Washington State Sea Grant's mission is to help people in marine life thrive by providing expertise and education supporting the conservation of ocean and coastal ecosystems. So to that end, David George Gordon is author of 22 books on topics ranging from slugs and snails to sharks and gray whales, including The Eat Above Cookbook. A naturalist, public speaker, and educator, he previously served as science writer for Washington Sea Grant. Samantha Larson is a mountaineer, science, scientist, and journalist. Her work has appeared in publications including National Geographic, Grist, and High Country News. She's currently a science writer at Washington Sea Grant. And Mary Ann Barry Wagner has for iconic Northwestern educational nonprofits, including Classical King FM Public Radio and the Burke Museum right across the way from us there. She's currently the lead for communications at Washington Sea Grant. They join us tonight for a conversation about the Pacific Northwest's beloved bivalve, the oyster. And on that note, I will go ahead and turn it over to our speakers. Thank you. We are thrilled to be here. This is very exciting for us. Um, for some of us, it's our first book, and for some of us, at least one of us, it's like, how many books, David? How many have you written? Too many. <laughs> and we're excited to be talking about the second edition of Heaven on the Half Shell, which is an updated history of oyster cultivation in the Northwest. Um, Watching Sea Grant, as Melissa said, partnered with University of Washington Press to produce the second edition. And we'd like to thank them for their steadfast support of this process, which was no small feat during the pandemic. I can tell you, it's not easy doing research for a book under those you know, constraints by the pandemic, which nobody knew was going to happen. So that was really exciting. Uh, and challenging, but it was something that the University of Washington Press really they stuck with us. They were our buddies all the way through the process. Um, and to give you a little uh, background on the book, Washington Sea Grant is based at the University of Washington and functions, just as Naima said, as a part of NOAA, conducting and actually funding high impact marine research, education, and outreach through Washington State. So it makes sense to do this book. Um, we pitched the idea to UW Press because the first book, published in 2001 by David here, uh, was over 20 years old, and so many things had changed in aquaculture since then. Uh, new technologies and, of course, a little thing called climate change. Um, so the book really needed a big overhaul, and there was a really need, a big need for this book uh, within the communities that actually harvest oysters, but also within uh, the communities of folks like you who, who love the oyster. So uh, as I said, uh, UW Press helped us to double the number of uh, pages to the book. We doubled the number of photos. Um, and it is now chock full of stories and a current look that it gives us on the production of oysters that are grown in our region. And this is, by the way, the largest oyster growing region in the United States right in our own backyard. So, yay. So I actually, with a, we don't need that there. Let me back that up. But I, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Sam Larson, my co colleague in all things at the University of Washington, and she's going to read the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So in this edition of the book, uh, we worked with uh, Melissa Shutton, uh, Chickasaw and former Washington Sea Grant staff, uh, to include a land acknowledgement. Uh, so before we go further, I wanted to read from that here. While the scope of this book covers the entire Pacific Northwest and beyond, most of the work was conducted in Washington State on the traditional land of indigenous peoples past and present. We honor the land itself and the indigenous peoples who have stewarded this place for millennia. We recognize that indigenous peoples have lived with, stewarded, shaped, and harvested the coastal resources that currently surround us since the time the glaciers receded. 
The authors of this book wish to recognize the stewards of the land, air, waters, and shores across what is now known as Washington's coastlines and the Salish Sea. These stewards include the tribes and bands signed into the Treaty of Point No Point, the Treaty of Point Elliot, the Medicine Creek Treaty, the Treaty of Olympia, the Treaty of Maya Bay, those recognized through executive orders, including the Shellwalter Bay Indian Tribe and the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation, and those tribes and bands that we wish to recognize, including the Duwamish, Wanapam, and Chuck peoples. And I'd now like to pass it back over to David, uh, who will tell you about the origin of the book. Well, thank you, Sam. You know, I love looking out at this sea of folks today. I haven't seen a crowd like this since I stopped giving talks about Sasquatch. <laughs> so if any of you have stories about personal sightings, please save them to the end of the program, because I know there's some good ones out here. Um, I actually worked on the original Heaven on the Half Cell book that was published in 2001. It was actually going to be released the day after 9-11. Do you believe that? So, of course, we postponed that opening. And I remember calling lots of people and saying, I know you weren't planning on coming to a party tonight, but if you were, we're not having it. So go home. <laughs> and it's been a long time. And as, as uh, Mary Ann said, lots has changed over the past 20 years. So it's kind of amazing. In a way, I feel like Rip Van Winkle having awakened to this incredible new world for oysters. I love oysters, by the way. Raise your hand. How many of you are indifferent about oysters? And how have you, many of you just flat out won't eat them? Well, that's a, better, that's a better ratio than when I wrote a bug cookbook, that's for sure. Okay. So when we started working on this book way back in the 1990s, the goal was, it was actually inspired by this gentleman, Earl Brenner, and his, he's a long-term oyster grower. I think he has a scrapbook that he had been keeping for 60 years of his history with the oyster industry. His son came to us and said, this scrapbook is going to disappear unless you take it. So we did, and we actually made a copy of that scrapbook. And in actuality, that book is now at the University of Washington Fisheries Library. So if you're really curious, the backstory begins with Earl Brenner. Quite the guy. Well, once we started working on that book, we realized there were lots of people that were multi-generation oyster farmers, sixth, seventh generation oyster farmers, and they all had really good stories to tell. So we started interviewing people, which was a lot easier to do before the pandemic. You could actually walk into someone's office and start a conversation the second go round. But we also solicited a lot of cool photographs. This is one of my favorites in the book. These are the Weigert family. And if you're from that area around Willapa Bay, you know the Weigerts. They're, they're famous. Uh, oyster entrepreneur or entire builders, as it says here. A uh, cool bunch of people, but they provided us in this picture of three of the Weigert, Weigert cousins when they were kids in the early 1940s. And of course, we interviewed a lot of those people. <clears throat> but enough about the people themselves. What I really want to talk about are the oysters. And you know, we're lucky in Washington, all over the East Coast, there's basically one species of oyster, whether we're talking about uh, New England or we're talking about the Gulf states or Florida, we're talking about Eastern oysters. Here in Washington, we have our choice of about five different kinds of oysters. And I want to talk briefly about those, just to put some context into this. Of course, our one native oyster is the Olympia oyster. Hard to find these days. They were harvested beyond a reasonable, sustainable amount and nearly became extinct. Now there are people doing restoration work, bringing their numbers back up. And if you play your cards right, you can even buy them at certain times of year to eat. They're smaller oysters. And um, traditionally, this is a native food. The 
indigenous populations of Washington had all sorts of ways of harvesting oysters. This is a wonderful photograph from the area on the, on the Olympic Peninsula. You can see the Olympic mountain range in the background there. Nice old family photograph. But my personal favorite from this era of harvesting native Olympia oysters is this photograph. It's a woman bending down to rake up clams and oysters. Kind of a traditional thing. But the interesting is, the thing is, the reason this picture is round, it was taken by a first generation Kodak camera. So way long ago in Mud Bay, the area around uh, Shelton and the uh, Squaxin Island tribe, it's pretty well documented. So rich and fertile area to be looking for good photos. This one came from the Alaska State Archives of all places. The next species I want to address is the Eastern Oyster. It's one of my favorites. That's the one that's up on down the East Coast. But well, as soon as they connected the golden, they drove the golden spike connecting the Transcontinental Railroad. Guess what was on those cars? Yes, that's right. Oysters that dumped into Willapa Bay. People were very familiar with this creature. They'd been eating them before they came out here during the gold rush of the 1840s. So that was their preferred oyster of choice. You can see in this nice photograph, it comes from the Pacific County Historical Museum. That's a historic boat, the Bay Point, but on the dock, all those barrels are full of eastern oysters. And they would dump them into, into Willapa Bay. The problem was the water temperature was a little too cold for them to grow rapidly or spawn. So it was a great idea for getting a crop growing in there, but it was not sustainable. You can see, though, I love finding these things. These are, here's a, a historic can of seal rock oysters. If you look, if you're a knowledgeable oyster eater and you look at the label, you go, oh, yes, that's an eastern oyster. It's not a Pacific, it's not a native, but there it is. So they were, they were uh, naturalized in their own way. They still find these eastern oysters from parts of Washington that are relics for when they were brought here from the East Coast. It's hard to imagine. The one really took off though is a Pacific oyster. This is a, an import also. It was brought here from Japan. This picture actually shows a receipt in the, from the early 1900s of someone who was buying what we call oyster seed. These are little baby oysters that have attached to bits of shell and a an oyster farmer could scatter these around on their property, and after about two years, because they're very fast-growing oysters, could harvest these. They really became the, the most popular oyster after a little bit of cell job to convince people these were the best. Now, it's interesting to me that a lot of people who are involved in this stage of the industry came from Japan. This is a wonderful picture, too. This is my the little baby in this picture, the two-year-old, is Jerry Yamashita, Japanese-American child, uh, being held by his dad, Masahide uh, Yamashita, who was actually one of the first importers of seed. He was actually a jeweler, which is why he's such a dapper dresser uh, in this picture. But I want to say that Jerry is now 100 years old. Yeah, I know. Let's have a big hand for him. I used to joke and say he was the nicest man in Puget Sound, and I'm told there are other people who feel that way too. He's still a wonderful person. Well, the Japanese oyster was a wonderful thing. I think Sam is going to talk about the role of Japanese Americans and Japanese natives in developing this industry here. But things were going along great until in one of those rare moments, like things were great until World War II began, and now there was no uh, seed from Japan. There also were no workers. Most of those people were taken out of their jobs and sent to uh, internment camps. So unfortunately, the Japanese oyster business went through a big change 
people were able to figure out that their oysters were actually spawning by themselves without introducing seed. So they were okay with that during World War II. Women became instrumental in working in canneries and things while most of the men were out, of, out doing the thing during World War II. And then, wouldn't you know it, the area that they dropped the first A-bomb on was a prime oyster growing area. So all of a sudden they couldn't get Japanese oysters if they wanted to. And the action moved to this one. Maybe those of you who are aficionados would know this one, the Kumamoto. It's a relative of the Japanese oyster. It's from a slightly different water system uh, in the Japanese islands. And these things have very deep cups and very raggedy shells. And you can still get those at uh, oyster farms all over Washington, thank heavens. So while these are doing great in Washington, some are not doing so well. This is a European black or Belon oyster. These are the ones that they used to eat in very old England. So the, what's his name, Swift quote about he was a bold man, what first ate an oyster? That they're talking about these Milan oysters. The last one I want to show you is what we're calling the flipped oyster. They also call them tumbled oysters. And if you like to go to an oyster bar, we were just at, at the Hamahama Oyster Bar yesterday, and they have their own flipped oyster. These are ones that are actually Japanese oysters, but they're raised in bags. So they're not sitting on the bottom getting barnacles and being preyed upon by starfish and so on. And the bags are put in where either manually they would go out at lower tides and flip the bags over. And in doing so, they're actually literally tumbling the oysters. It, it, it shapes them in such a way that a lot of the ragged edges are broken off. I think in the book I say they're basically Pacific oysters with a manicure. <laughs> and people have further refined this technology and created their own various brands of oysters. But this is another style of growing oysters in bags like this that's actually influenced by the tides. They have a little float on each bag, and when the tide comes in, it raises the oyster bag up. The oysters tumble down, of course go through that, that slight, whatever, aberration. And then uh, the tide goes out, the oysters are gently brought down to rest. And today you can have blue pools, you can have cushy oysters, you have all these different choices that are devised through this technology. It also creates a deeper cup, so the meat in the oyster is a lot. It was really noticeable when we were in Hamahama the other day. And of course, we love those oysters, so good deal. Well, this is the part of the program I want to just give a brief, what I call oysters for dummies talk. Just like the books that they sell here, my favorite title is NASCAR for dummies. <laughs> yes. Anyway, things really picked up in Washington after the gold rush. This is an old picture mocking the people who are likely to come by ship from the East Coast, ready to get a zillion dollars, strike it rich on the, during the gold strikes of the 1840s, bringing everything they needed to get out into the back country. And the action was mostly centered at that point around San Francisco Bay. Believe it or not, that's what it looked like way back when. But see all those ships in the far corner? It was not going to be a sleepy little town for forever because lots of people were coming here. One of those newly arrived, Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, probably one of America's greatest writers. And he's the one who gave us the title for the book because he was referring to a particular hotel in San Francisco and he called it Heaven on the Half Shell. So I'd like to at least mention where that came from anyway. It's from Mark Twain. Well, the great part about harvesting oysters for people who arrived here, wow, all these oysters just waiting to be eaten. It was like the walrus and the carpenter. But after a time, they literally had eaten all of the oysters out of San Francisco Bay. Everyone's going, now what are we going to do? 
And actually, the action switched over to Willapa Bay, which was then called Shoalwater Bay. Here's a great photograph of an early oyster harvester. It's not a farmer, just someone who shows up. You can see they have tribal helpers. And they have low time. Bring in lots of oysters. Enjoy them. And actually ship them down to San Francisco. So now you can actually read the newspapers from the time. The first Willapa Bay oysters have arrived. They're like really excited about this accomplishment. There's a little moment mentioned in this book by James Swan, the historian from uh, Shoalwater Bay, where he's showing this picture in there. He says, this is a, the home of Captain Russell. And next to it is the smaller home of Chief Tope in Topeland that area of Willapa Bay. And he says that Charles Russell should be, should be deserving of a statue to his name made entirely out of oyster shells. I still think someone should do that. That would be a cool thing to dedicate uh, Charles Russell's contribution to life in the Bay Area. So that's the earliest history of the oyster industry today. Things changed as time went on. This is Trevor Kincaid. He founded the University of Washington's zoology department and was very instrumental in helping early oyster farmers get the science behind what they were doing. And sure enough, with his help and some encouragement from individuals, they started shipping really large quantities of oyster seed. All these boxes are full of thousands and thousands of baby oysters waiting to be spread out. And you can see the end result of this were tidelands the like had never been seen since. Enormous oyster mounds uh, and beds that just go on for forever. It's all natural harvest. That action still kind of continues today. We have these really rich beds all over Wilpa and elsewhere at Canal. And it's largely a manual labor People come out and collect these, put them in, in enormous bags, and then the bags get shipped into, onto a barge and brought into processing plants. So the modern day oyster farm is something that we talk about a lot in the book, but actually evolved very slowly over time, going back to the 18, late 1800s, early 19. Well, I've been doing a great job of windbagging you all, so I hope you're enjoying the, the hot air. And um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Sam Larson, who's going to tell you a little bit about what's new with this book. Thank you very much. to this book was uh, several years ago. Before I started at Washington Sea Grant, I was writing a lot of articles for CrossFit, the local Seattle news site. And I actually did a series about the oyster aquaculture industry. And I was so fascinated to learn about what I thought of as a very simple food, how complex it actually was to produce it. Um, so the first edition of Cousin on the Half Shelf was one of the main resources that I used. Um, and I also had some opportunities to connect with David over the years. I got a, a bug cooking demonstration up at a grist headquarters, and uh, I got to read a review of this uh, book on the Sasquatch Seekers field guide. Um, so I was personally delighted when he reached out to Marianne and I about working on a new, revised, and expanded uh, second edition of Huck on the Half Shelf. So in this revised edition, we uh, added a whole new chapter, and we added a lot of other text uh, throughout. Um, but to begin the process, I just wanted to share a little bit. Uh, we worked really closely with a team of expert advisors um, both on the new developments that had happened since 2001 and on older history that we felt could be more fully told. Uh, so our, as you can see here, our advisors include a team of about a dozen people, including Washington Sea Grant staff with expertise ranging from ocean acidification to social science, 
um, and also industry professionals and scientists. And we're so grateful for the input that we've received at various stages of this process. So one of the big things that we wanted to do with the second edition was focusing on highlighting more diversity and more women who are involved in the aquaculture industry. Uh, we include expertise, quotes, anecdotes, and photos from more women and more people of color throughout the text. Uh, this is more or less subtly woven in throughout the text. Our real aim was to reflect the community as it really is. Um, and in the case of featuring women, we had to dig a little deeper to find some examples of the older history. Uh, one example is that we dug up the 1931 thesis of Bell Stevens, who was a student. As far as the current history, um, we were delighted by how easy it was <laughs> to feature uh, more women, especially. Um, a lot, if you look around in the halls of marine sciences, there are so many women who are. Uh, Years in their field today. Um, and we are also delighted to find that while the original oyster farmers were all really run by men, um, a lot of those have been passed down through the generations to their children, um, and it seems like especially to their daughters. Um, so there's a lot of powerful women figures, including a group that we discovered that calls themselves the Oyster Divas, which I don't know. We include a new uh, section of the book on the critical role of labor from immigrant communities and how over the decades these workers have immigrants from China, Japan, and also from Central America, where so much of the shellfish resource comes from, workforce comes from today. And we spend some time discussing these trends in the book. Um, in full disclosure, we uh, encountered some challenges interviewing uh, members of the immigrant workforce for today for I think a variety of reasons. Um, but I think it was really important to include and I'm also really proud that I think this intention has helped us and Washington Sea Grant Communications put some of our efforts in reaching these communities, including translating some of our written materials into Spanish. Another really big focus was um, we expanded and centralized our telling of indigenous history. We included a new section toward the beginning of chapter one titled The First Optical Tourist, for which David interviewed experts such as Charlene Price, the executive director of the Swanson Island Museum Library and Research Center, and master of basket weaver Ed Carrier. Uh, pictured here, who is an elder with the Suquamish tribe and has been increasingly recognized for his uh, devotion to the uh, tradition of basket weaving. We also added history about the Chinook, Lewis, Shell Walter Bay, and other tribes and how these people have relied on the fruits of both Willapa Bay and Puget Sound since time immemorial. And our focus on tribal uh, history uh, connects to what's going on today as well. Um, we added a new section on the landmark 1994 treaty decision, which affirmed the rights of treaty tribes in Washington to harvest shellfish from their usual and accustomed uh, fishing grounds. Um, this led to then led um, to settlements uh, through which a lot of tribes bought and leased tribe lands. And this is why a lot of tribes in Washington own and operate their own um, shellfish farms today. The story of the Rafiti decision goes back to the uh, history of the fish wars of the 1960s and 1970s, which some of you may have heard of, um, which led to the 1974 Bolt decision, uh, which affirmed the rights of treaty tribes in Washington to harvest 50% of the harvestable salmon and trout in the state. Um, we also talked with um, indigenous growers such as Kurt Burnell about the legacy of the Rafiti decision. And the expanded text, especially in the new chapter at the end, covers a lot of the big new challenges that Mr. Farmers face. 
Uh, this includes a story of, as Marina mentioned, global warming, a big new challenge, or not so new actually, but um, something that needed to be covered. And also the story of how global warming's evil twin ocean acidification had decimated the stocks of Pacific North hatcheries in the early 2000s, and how acidic red water continues uh, to threaten marine ecosystems today. Uh, for example, in this photo, uh, we see a terracot, which is a tiny marine organism at the base of the food web, and its shell is visibly damaged from ocean acidification, if you look on the left side. And since oysters also make their shells from calcium carbonate, um, especially at the larval phase, um, when the water is too acidic, it's really difficult for them to grow properly and form their shells. But oyster farmers are adapting um, as they find uh, new practices and ways to use and monitor the water they use. In particular, there's a device known as the percolator, which is a game changer because it allows hatchery managers uh, to see when the level of seawater is too acidic. And then they can adjust the schedule of their spawning uh, to wait for when conditions are more favorable, or they can add a buffer to the water to reduce the pH. The text also covers ongoing challenges such as pollution, burrowing shrimp, harmful algal blooms, when the historic June 2021 heat wave hit, just as we were wrapping up the manuscript to send to the W Press, uh, this heat wave decimated the crops of a lot of uh, shellfish growers. And it was a real time demonstration of how damaging environmental um, challenges can be for grain farmers and a reminder of what's at stake. <coughs> but the new text tells hopeful stories as well. Uh, the success story of getting invasive sparks China under control, the huge efforts that David was referring to earlier to restore Olympia oyster populations, bringing uh, the native oysters back into um, local waters. Um, in this photo, we see Betsy Peabody of the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, who's one of our folks' advisors and is also leading a lot of these efforts to restore Olympia oysters. And the new text also covers um, exciting changes like how oyster culture is gaining new momentum in places like Alaska and Humboldt Bay. Another new story in the book that I find particularly hopeful are the of tribal nations to reclaim food sovereignty and build resilience uh, through food gardening. This past summer, the Swinomish and Native tribal community built the first known modern-day clam garden in the U.S., and in doing so, revived an ancient traditional practice that will hopefully continue again for generations. The book also tells the story of how crucial oyster growers have been in and maintaining clean water. Puget Sound has particularly struggled with water quality for about 100 years at this point with contaminants related to industry, agriculture, and population growth, threatening the health of local ecosystems. But because oyster farmers literally depend on clean water for their livelihoods, they have historically been leaders in the fight for clean water against pollution. And we think this is yet another reason to love oysters. Overall, we think this book tells the story of the adaptability and evolution that people who farm sell to be our favorite shellfish. The past 20 years has seen a sharp rise in the popularity of oysters on the half shell, and the industry has developed new technologies and growing methods to satisfy this hunger, such as the rise of the tripoloid oyster and new culture techniques such as flip oysters. And many of these changes really came from a rise in food culture as more people want fresh, locally sourced foods and delicious ways to prepare them. So in this day, we also revamped and expanded upon the recipes that we included in this book, which is an effort that Mary Ann led and will speak to you now. Uh, 
want to acknowledge that we have a special person way back. Louise Little is the CEO of University Book Stars, and she was a story sister of mine. And hello, Louise. Thank you. Yes, I would say that overall. Speak out. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Overall, we think the book tells a story of. Oh, I think you did. I knew it on. Eating oysters raw on the half shell is only one way we eat our oysters. Uh, as you see here, with oysters from Hog Island in California, one of my other favorite places to get oysters. Uh, when you read the book, you'll notice that recipes are integrated throughout the book, uh, supporting the stories and the themes that both uh, David and Sam were just talking about. The recipes look at the ways that people prepare them and the ways that they have eaten them, past and present. And in this new edition, we paired the recipes with local Pacific Northwest wines and beers uh, to kind of bring home, you know, the whole local, eat local, grow local, and um, to table its story. I consulted with a sommelier that specializes in locally produced beverages. One beer even hails from my hometown of Kenmore, Washington, one bottle, whichever you prefer. Um, and most importantly, these recipes uh, remind us of the end activity which is to eat them. We cannot get that. With, we purposefully made selections that are a cross-section of recipes spanning the Pacific Northwest from Alaska and Canada to Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, uh, including both old and new recipes. Some of the styles of cooking oysters have gone out of fashion, um, but still taste good and are worthy of us remembering them and documenting those. So we included a few of those. Uh, for example, we have a photo of the 1920s recipe for pan roasted oysters by Aunt Gert of Coquium uh, at the Southwest Washington coastline. And uh, that's where many of our oyster farms are. I got this recipe from Don Smart, who's telling me that the recipes were given to her uh, by her grandparents, who were neighbors to Aunt Gert, um, who used to uh, harvest the oysters right out of her backyard and then share them and all her recipes as well at the local summer picnic. And we have an 1885 recipe for native Olympia oysters uh, that calls for eating the oysters with coleslaw, two words. Uh, what we know today is coleslaw. This comes from the very first Northwest cookbook, the very first, uh, called the Webfoot Cookbook. It's tiny and it's uh, not very large, uh, but you're still available online if you're really into recipes like I am. Um, and I really love that name. It's so Northwesty. Um, and the recipe is a study in simplicity with no measurements. Um, so I, I, I tried this a couple of times and I have to say it turned out really well. <laughs> oh, three times. Um, so the oysters in this recipe would have had to have been Olympia because at that time there were no other oysters. There were no specifics. There were no momentos. Right, David? Yeah, so that's kind of a cool recipe. Um, and cutting edge contemporary oyster cuisine now make up what you often see in it. We inclu included a few of these dishes by well known chefs. One was the 2020 Top Chef fan favorite, Shota Nakayima, based right here in Seattle. His miso soup with oysters is, is really light and very delicate, uh, the opposite of most oyster stews. Um, and being an innovative chef, he used garlic scapes um, or young garlic sprouts uh, that you might have seen growing out of your old um, garlic bulbs. If you leave them laying you know, lay around too long, they start to sprout. He actually harvested those and puts those into this recipe instead of your everyday scallions. So it's really very creative. The growth of sales for oysters on the half shell were partly made possible by the new technologies mentioned by Sam earlier, uh, such as the tumbling oysters. So we had to include a few of the more contemporary uh, treatments. The recipe of oysters with cucumber sorbet in particular caught my eye. It's by Becky Selinget, who is a local chef. Uh, she's actually the chef right now in the valley of the Virginia Five. Uh, so she tours around the, the um, Puget Sound in Alaska. Um, that, that's just one gig that she does. She's also the author of several seafood books that are for sale right here in, in this bookstore, um, including Good Fish. 
So I learned to make sorbet because of this book. And I am here to tell you it's super easy. And I would never ever have thought I would be cooking cucumber in sorbet, but it's the perfect thing for summer. This is like the thing now is um, I'm going to be making cucumber sorbet every summer. It's easy, fast, and really is fun. We chose to balance the innovative recipes with some classics. This stew from Portland chef Corey uh, Schreiber employs native Olympia oysters, which are making a hopeful comeback as both um, Sam and, and uh, David were saying from the brink of extinction. Many thanks to restorations that um, Puget Sound Restoration Fund and the local native tribes are really working on. Uh, you can now find them in some seafood markets. So you should just call ahead. Corey, by the way, is the great grandson of Louie, the founder of Portland's longest running oyster bar called Dan and Louie's. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has ever been there, knows of Dan and Louie's, but it is still there. They're still thriving, serving oysters. And Corey learned to wash dishes and saute oysters when he was just a little boy with his you know, nose to the countertop not that high. And now he's, he's gone on to be quite an accomplished chef. And we have recipes that echo the topics in the book. For example, we sought to be inclusive of the diverse communities that industry. So we've included a group of Asian American oyster dishes, like this Asian oyster stir fry by Zin Dwelly of Shelton, Washington. I stopped by her place uh, last year to get a before I had even sat down, she was hand feeding me her Asian oyster spring rolls. There I am with like my clipboard trying to be official and everything. And, and she's like putting food in my mouth in her kitchen. Um, so we had a really fun time, needless to say, and I completely forgot why I came. <laughs> it didn't matter. Um, good food does that. Native cultures have for millennia been shaping uh, the art of cultivation and prep. One traditional method for preparing oysters noted in the book is one some of you may have employed yourself while picnicking on the beaches of Puget Sound. Uh, first, digging a shallow trench with rocks for fire, and when those uh, coals burn down, the fire burns down, you have uh, nice hot coals, you place your oysters across the rocks, and then you cover that with seafood, excuse me, yes, seafood, but also with um, lots of kelp and um, anything you can find on the beach to kind of secure that. And then they steam themselves and they're tasty. And that takes, you know, maybe an hour, but that is the traditional method for cooking. A contemporary Native American recipe by the Jamestown Slalom tribe integrates smoked oyster with lavender, which makes sense since lavender is a common local product that's swim today. And I thought I would read just one introduction from the book uh, mostly because my big sis Diane said I should, and we always do what our big sisters say. Uh, so um, here it is. Oyster is one of the um, Native American contributions to this book. Uh, it says, try this alternative to the classic oysters, Rockefeller with hazelnuts, which are native to the Pacific Northwest. Mike Height, the recipes creator, says, I like to serve this dish when our families gather especially in the fall and winter months in the Pacific Northwest. Most of my family live on Orcas Island, where the littles to grams and everyone else in between relish this dish. It's, it is just lovely to serve over a bed of hazelnuts in the shell. And I totally agree, as I wrote here, the warm brown of hazelnuts against the opaque white of the oyster shells is a beautiful contrast and reminds one of the sea to forest bounty and how well they complement each other. Um, so for that, I want to thank Mike, who is a member of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community in La Conner, Washington. So half-shell dishes like this lend themselves to the tied-to-table trend that we see with outdoor restaurants and, and the services that um, actual oyster farms are now offering uh, right on the farm or similar to that, such as at Goose Point's Oyster in um, Oh, in Willamette, actually, or Marshall's Oyster Bar in Northern California, and Hamahama Oysters in New New Washington, where we were just yesterday. So the takeaway for us as authors bringing this book up to the date uh, that we have today here is a renewed appreciation 
for the multi-generational families and the diverse communities that cultivate and care for those muddy shorelines where oysters grow. And we also appreciate all the people who do the work of keeping our shellfish environments healthy and clean. So thank you. I think that's Do some questions for you if you have any questions from the audience. And if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> oh, here we have a question. I remember working on a newsletter to the Voice Monster. It was commissioned about 20 years ago that was talking about seeing and growing um, native Olympic oysters in Kentucky Bay. And I wondered if you're a sis or So the question is, um, she, you heard that there was some reseeding in Discovery Bay, and you wanted to know if that has worked. So uh, I know there's still seeding in that area. You know, I'm going to throw in that when we were filming yesterday with a woman from Squim, she mentioned that the tribes are now very actively bringing the Olympia oyster back to that area. Um, throughout the strait, but particularly around the Discovery Bay and Squim Bay. So that was great to hear. Um, yeah, in the book, we have a great photo of a barge with oyster shell going out to Discovery Bay from the Peach and Salmon Restoration Fund. And we got some great stats from Betsy Peabody, whose photo we shared. Oyster and how it's going, but to be honest, I can't pull them off of the top of my head. But I, it's in the book, and I'm a little proud. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. The question is, what's the role of the triploid oyster in the marketplace? What's the percentage in the marketplace that might be triploid? First of all, we might want to define what triploid is. You know, I have to throw in on this one, too. Because that word triploid may be unfamiliar to you all. It's actually referring to the fact that they can now breed oysters. Sounds contradictory. But they can breed oysters that have three sets of chromosomes, not the usual two. So triploid refers to, or triploid refers to having extra chromosomes. And it basically renders these oysters, the nickname for them is sexless oysters. Because they don't spawn, they have to be created anew to have more triploid oysters, which is either done through pressure treatments or chemical mutagens, which I don't think is done much anymore. But a very large percentage of chef oysters, the ones you buy in a jar, are, are triploid oysters. I remember at the time I was working on the first book, it was about 90% of all jar of oysters were triploid. And that number has not changed that much. With all those half shell oysters that we throw blue and on over, those are largely two chromosome oysters. So less so in the half. So people find you Oh, you know what? That came about in research times when they were trying to figure out there was actually a phenomenon no one has summer mortality. Oysters were dying for some reason in intertidal areas in summer times, and they thought at that time they reasoned that during the summer is when oysters are breeding, so they're already kind of weakened from the, like, like college kids, from, um, <laughs> from too much spawning. <laughs> so they thought if we can breed sexless oysters, we'll be done with that problem. Um, Kenneth Chu, who actually wrote the foreword to the book, was very instrumental in coming up with this technology, which actually became more of an industry standard, but less of a victory in terms of the summer mortality. Thank you. But I think Sam wants to add to answer the question about why triploid. Right. Oh, yes. I was going to jump onto the summer mortality, but um, I bet I can. The why triploid is. It, my understanding is that, as David was saying, that having the months 
where the oysters are spawning makes the oysters substantially less tasty. Then you get the gonads in there, um, which are kind of just like gooey and not very good. Um, so having triploid oysters allows for year-round oysters, um, and which is great. <laughs> so that, that old adage about only eating oysters in months that end with R no longer applies. In, That's um, right. Yeah. And now I got to say though that you can also have um, you can also have oysters that are from so it's like winter time all the time down there. Or if you really want to get spendy, you can have some shipped in from New Zealand where they grow oysters, and it's winter time there during our summer. So there are lots of options besides triplets to go with. Uh, but I was going to add on the, the summer mortality, because that was something that had continued and was really mysterious to a lot of the shellfish farmers and researchers couldn't figure out why these big uh, oyster die-offs were happening in the summers. Um, but we recently, uh, one of our Washington Sea Grant um, aquaculture specialists was part of a research project narrowing in on a certain kind of um, algae that produces a certain toxin that isn't harmful to humans, um, but it's very harmful to oysters. And so hopefully that will uh, help manage the summer mortality issue, knowing that when these movements are out there. The takeaway is um, you can eat oysters your right. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Other questions? I see a question there. Um, I was wondering maybe just each of you could share briefly one gem of a surprising little like, fact that you learned in the research for this book that just sort of surprised me. The question is asking the authors to share one surprising little fact and factoid that we learned during the development of the book. Um, I'd like to pass that over to my colleagues. <laughs> I have to throw this in there because I was thinking about this the other day. My mom, who's no longer alive, used to tell us a story. Don't ask me what inspired this. It was one of her like bedtime stories about an oyster who was trying really hard to produce a pearl for his sweetheart. Do you know the story, anyone? And it was a lot of effort, but the other oyster didn't want a pearl. He wanted a square cut emerald. <laughs> so he tried and tried and tried and tried, and so the story goes, and eventually came up with a square cut emerald for his sweetie, only to find out, as some oysters do, his sweetie had changed sexes and was no longer interested in his advances. <laughs> now, would you tell that story to your five year old? My mom said that. All right, thank you. I can go. I have, uh, I have a couple of that something that Sam actually mentioned that really kind of rose to the top was the fact that oysters are now being grown by multi generational families who are led by women. And uh, women are just, I have to say, they're taking over the industry. And that was really, you know, really a wonderful thing to see and to meet these women who call themselves the oyster divas. And, they came to an event that we recently had last week, and they, they really support each other. They're supportive. They are specific. You know, they're not uh, protective of the information. Everybody's working together very collaboratively, and that's, that was a big take. Um, I have a more kind of, I guess, technical answer to this, but um, I don't know if some of you had uh, seen some of the newspaper headlines about oyster hatcheries moving to Hawaii. Um, and I was really fascinated learning more about that um, and how a lot of growers are doing that in response to ocean acidification, but that's not the only reason. And it turned out that this had kind of been a trend even before figuring out that that was a way to deal with acidified waters was there's a, a a facility in Hawaii that they were starting to grow their seed in and then shipping it out to Washington. Um, but in my mind, that was just like really mind blowing about, again, my point about how complex this industry is to produce this, uh, this food that 
I mean, it still is in a lot of cases, just you can walk down to the Thai flat and harvest it. Um, and there's definitely still that tradition, but there's a lot of other layers to keeping the industry alive. Questions, yes. But this is a question asking for us to comment on Ken Chu's contributions to the industry. I have to again dive in on this. Ken Chu, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting him, was a wonderful man. He wrote the foreword to the original book in 2001, and also did a lot of his on his own, a lot of fundraising to make that book possible. But you know, a lot of the people that are very active in the industry today were Ken Chu's students in uh, their early years in college. And you know, when I went to his retirement party, it went on for forever, and everyone wanted to have the last word, which of course was impossible. But what came out most often, which I thought was funny, was how Ken was great at mooching food from the growers. And he'd call people up and say, I'm going down to Olympia today, and I'm going to be driving past your hotel in 